Well, uh, thank you very much for the organizers for uh, having me here, but also for scheduling this so perfectly because, you know, after Mukamin's talk, I have zero introduction to make. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the survey that we're doing with GTF, looking at massive white doors and looking for rapidly variable massive white doors. Uh, and most of the ones that, I'm, that we are finding are actually mergers and uh, Mukamin and uh, Lutikov already showed uh, these objects, so let's start from there. This is the moon size white dwarf, maybe, again, we have to check the UV. We just got the spectrum, so um, we had this discussion these this, uh, days about maybe uh, magnetic white dwarfs have this break in the UV, so we have to check the UV to see if really have a good handle on the masses. For this one, I did have UV, but they are looking further away in the UV. But however, it's very, very, very massive, uh, about 1.35 solar masses, and it's rapidly rotating, seven minutes, uh, and highly magnetized, it's about 800 mega gauss. So this is kind of like the poster child uh, of the uh, merger remnant. Uh, and so this was really the, only the first one that we looked at, and so now we're finding many, many more. But how are we finding them? So we are focusing on the massive part of the HR diagram. So we are using Gaia and Nicola's catalog. And then we match them with DTF and we look for periodic objects. And of course, then we follow them up with Chimera because sometimes the periods are actually twice of what we see in DTF. And to understand why they're viable, we follow them up uh, with uh, spectra. So here you can see this is, is the light curve and the spectrum of uh, the moon size white dwarf. Uh, and uh, let's see, we, let me just go backward for a second. Okay, so how do we, how do we figure out that they're ma magnetic? So not, not everyone is super familiar with magnetic white dwarfs. So I'm just gonna give a small explanation. Uh, over there, there's a familiar spectrum of a DA white dwarf. Um, if you have a magnetic field, uh, the, um, levels in the hydrogen atoms, they uh, are not degenerate, degenerate in NLM anymore in the quantum uh, numbers, uh, but the magnet, but, so if something, uh, for example, if the electron is switching from two and three or two and four, and the delta M is plus one or minus one or zero, uh, you have actually different energy uh, uh, jumps. And so that's the Zeeman splitting and and that's why uh, we see three uh, H alpha here instead of only one and how far apart they are uh, depends on the strength of the magnetic field. And then at higher, at higher magnetic fields, then you have not only these three uh, components, the L degeneracy gets split to, uh, so it gets listed to, and then actually the magnetic field gets all over the place, which is, why often we see them to be completely featureless, uh, while other times you can still see the, the lines, for example, this one uh, that have a minimum or a maximum energy, they're called stationary lines. Uh, and that's where uh, yeah, you have the, the jump that is at the same energy as a, in the, at the same wavelength for a big range of fields. And so those are the easier ones to detect. Uh, and so, in this way, we, are, we have found a large sample of magnetic, rapidly rotative, massive white doors. And so this could be a good sample of possible merger remnants because they have two of the three uh, characteristics that Mukamin was talking about before. So here is like some characteristic. We have found them, of course, mostly above 0.9 solar masses because that's where we focused. Uh, big range of temperatures, but mostly uh, hot because it has, you know, you need them to be pretty bright to see a variation. And most of them rotating, you know, maximum a couple of hours, but mostly less than half an hour periods. Uh, and a big range of magnetic fields too. Um, so, oh yes, this is an example of what you can do actually with the phase resolve spectroscopy. Uh, this is actually a neat example of a 10 minutes rotator where you can see from the spectrum 
that the magnetic field is, var is varying over the surface. So if you look at the green spectrum, for example, we see lines that are around, I don't know, 80 mega gauss. And then if you, they shift like this one, for example, it shifts towards the, the red uh, and it shifts to be maybe 200 mega gauss uh, after 10 minutes. And so we are seeing the, the uh, magnetic field varying over the surface. So with some of these objects, we can actually do a like tomographic study of how uh, the magnetic field is varying over the surface of the white dwarf. Uh, soon we're gonna get also uh, spectropolarimetry observations, which also help in understanding uh, the geometry of the magnetic field of the white dwarf. So this is an extremely interesting sample. Um, and so I think, uh, why should we care about this sample? It depends on what you're interested in. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do with these. For example, if you're interested in type 1A, these are the ones that barely exploded. So maybe we can get uh, a, uh, a merger rate from these and then constrain the contribution of double degenerate to type 1A. If you're interested in LISA, uh, these are also, we can also constrain the population of short period binaries. Uh, from their kinematics also, we can understand this evolution of these objects. For example, we were talking about the merger delay. So if you have a sample that we know are merger, then we can maybe get a sense of the merger delay. And so what are the usual period in which these things came out, come out of a common envelope? Uh, and then magnetic white doors, there's lots that we can do with this uh, sample. So this is all very cool. So when is the data coming out? When are you publishing? Uh, this is a very uh, large and uh, complicated sample. We're still, I'm still collecting data. Uh, some objects are easy to understand, like that one or that one. Some are a little bit more complicated, some are strange. Uh, but the most point that I'm interested in right now is uh, try and understand the selection effect and the completeness of my sample. But the catalog is coming out soon. Uh, but while I'm looking for mergers, I'm also looking for other strange, variable, massive, rapidly rotating white doors. And so I have another cool object to show, which I already showed in Tübingen. So for those that were there, uh, I'm sorry for the repetition, but I thought it would be cool to show. Again, this is another object that we found in the area of the CMD. Uh, and this is the beautiful data from uh, Hypercam that uh, Tom Marsh uh, provided. Um, and so this is a um, yeah, 15 minutes uh, rotation period, uh, sinusoidal light curves, you know, uh, pretty massive white doors around one solar masses, 1.2 solar masses. Uh, and this is what the spectrum looks like. Uh, so in red, you can see uh, helium lines, and in blue, hydrogen lines. So pretty weak uh, lines of hydrogen and helium, no evident magnetic field. But then when you look at the phase results spectrum, you can see that some lines, like the hydrogen lines are strong at phase one, for example, up there in blue, and they completely disappear at phase 0.5. Uh, while the helium lines are stronger, they are strong at phase 0.5 and they completely disappear uh, at phase one. Uh, so this is a double phase object on only hydrogen on one side and only helium on the other side. Uh, so it's a, it's a very cool white dwarf, I think. Uh, and we call it Janus because it's the double phase Roman god of transition. And it could be a pretty good uh, name also because Jan Janus maybe is a transitioning white dwarf. Uh, as many of you know, there is a, 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 temp a range in temperatures between you know, 50,000 and 30,000 degrees where we see a lot fewer helium dominated uh, white dwarfs with respect to cooler temperatures. So if you go past you know, 30,000, 25,000 degrees, uh, you have an increase in dBs by a factor of three about. And so um, the reason why we think there is this gap 
in this temp in this range of temperatures is because you know you know the hydrogen floats and you need very very little hydrogen to cover the entire surface of a white dwarf. Uh, and so maybe between those temperatures that's what's happened, even if you have very, very little hydrogen it's still enough to cover the entire surface of most white dwarfs. Uh, and then when they heat about 30,000 degrees uh, that's when the convection in the helium layer right below the hydrogen becomes strong enough that you know it breaks into the hydrogen layer and dilutes the hydrogen and so that's where dbs appear uh, and so this could be janus is about that temperature you know we fitted uh with hydrogen and helium models we, all, we got also uv light curve and we get that janus is about thirty-five thousand degrees uh and so it is about the right temperature for that transition and maybe that's what's happening uh, Janus is going through this transition. It has very little hydrogen on its surface. And maybe what's causing the difference between the two phases is that on one side, the magnetic field is strong. There's a, sorry, there's a tiny magnetic field on the surface, which on one side is strong enough to inhibit convection. And on the other side is weaker. And so convection has already won and has already diluted the hydrogen. So on the stronger magnetic field, Phase, we see the hydrogen, and on the weaker, we see the helium. So that's a possibility. Uh, another possibility that Jim Fuller proposed is that uh, instead, you still need a magnetic field. Because, you know, if you have a fluid and you have hydrogen on one side and helium on the other side, you need something to, to create this difference. So magnetic field is kind of the only thing that can do it. Uh, but in this case, you're not invoking convection. In this case, you're just thinking if you have a higher magnetic pressure on one phase than on the other, then you have a lower gas pressure, and then the hydrogen can diffuse towards this high lower gas pressure uh, region caused by the magnetic field. And so you have some sort of a hydrogen ocean uh, at the magnetic pole. Uh, in, in this case as well, you need a very low magnetic, uh, very high, low hydrogen content. We're talking about 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 17 solar masses of hydrogen. So very tiny. Uh, and I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Oh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I'm Si Hao Chong from IAS. Um, so can kind of when the, uh, finally you mentioned two possible uh, uh, processes to to create these uh, double phase uh, white dwarfs um, that must be very rare right I kind of wonder how these the, the the theoretical rate of having these i mean two uh, processes to work compared to like the sample size and from the sample you have one so then the rate of discovering these white dwarf observationally and how does that compare to theoretical expectation? Thank you. So um, the, the thing is that this object is at 400 parsec, so it's not super close. So you don't need them to be very uh, common. I think what makes this object a bit special is that you need a specific geometry. Uh, you know, if you have a spot of hydrogen on a helium surface, for example, for the helium to completely disappear, you need a very specific geometry. So this could be a rare object. How rare are they in general to have this sort of a variation? I don't know, because it would depend, you know, how long this transition happens. So what will happen in the future is that the convection becomes strong enough that the hydrogen will be destroyed everywhere, right? And so it's, it's a, it's a matter of like how, you know, it depends on, the, on which, which case you're looking at, right? But I think in both cases, like in this, in this case, you have a bigger range of temperatures because it just has to be hotter than, uh, it has to be hotter than when convection is too strong and is gonna destroy this, this configuration, uh, but it's to, it has to be uh, cold enough that the hydrogen is diffused all the way to the surface. But it's not, it's not we're not talking about 10,000 years, right? You're talking about still, you know, probably, tens or hundreds of millions of years. So I don't think it's so super rare. 
And I think I found already other similar objects in my sample, not this extreme. I think to have this, this like double phase, it has to be a particular geometry. Larry, can you go back to your diagram where you show the uh, HR, di HR diagram of your sample? And yeah, that, that's good enough. Um, it struck me that this diagram is very different than Bookman's diagram. I mean, in the sense that his stars, I guess you have to go to the previous, the earlier one where you showed uh, the magnetic ones. Uh, yes, I'm getting there. Uh, yeah, okay. So they, these look like a less massive sample than oh, the 25 yeah. parsec sample. And is that, is that correct? Or is there some selection effect I don't understand here? So the background dots are, I don't remember in this one, I think they're the 100 parsec sample. Those are the background dots. Uh, and, and that's it. This is Gaia DR3. But your sample is all along the lowest masses, right? Yeah, yeah. Masses, that's what we selected. Yeah. So we specifically looked at just those the most massive ones, right? Okay. And these are maybe the, these are the oxygen neon models from uh, it might it might be also different models that we're showing here, like the cooling curves might be different. These are the oxygen neon models from Pantasa, for example. So you selected every phase. No, the objects are not okay. But also, like if you if you're interested, for example, Xiao found an interesting white dwarf that was variable in that region. If you find an interesting white dwarf, I will probably have some data on it, and I'm very happy to share and collaborate. So just <laughs> reach out if you're interested in anything in that region that is variable in CTF. Like probably I will have looked at it. Okay, one last question there. Okay, um, I'm Nicola Gentile Fusillo. I'm at ISAC. Um, the mass, uh, sorry, back to Janus. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. uh, the hydrogen envelope you mentioned is very, very thin. Yes. Uh, which, which makes me wonder what would this, if, if you took away the magnetic field, what would it look like? Uh... Well, it's not clear because there's been a lot of papers recently on the DB gap and the amount of hydrogen that you need to cover the entire surface. It depends because you're talking about the, 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 the hydrogen, which is at the surface and it's the total hydrogen, right? Which are two different things because sometimes, you know, the diffusion takes a long time. And so the, um, the distribution of hydrogen in the atmosphere, there's actually a lot of hydrogen that is not in, in, the, in the upper layer, depending on the temperature. So, and, and for example, there was the Bedard, you remember Bedard gave a talk about this that in tubing and showing that, you know, the fraction of hydrogen was much, much larger than these in most of the objects that are expected to transition. Uh, so here I'm just talking about surface hydrogen that you need. There might be more hydrogen underneath that it hasn't had the time to come up yet. Uh, uh, and so it depends on the fraction of hydrogen. If this fraction of hydrogen on the entire, that you need on the entire surface to cover the entire surface is 10 to the minus 16 solar masses. So in the case of the pool, uh, you, would see, you would see it as a, a DA white dwarf. But again, the total hydrogen and the surface hydrogen are two different things. But in the case of the ocean, it's, it, it would just look as a DA white dwarf. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, we have to stop here. I know there's a question in the back, so maybe we can stay for a coffee break. All right, let's yes. uh, thank, thank you, Larry, again. <laughs>